Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Adam Strauss Show, uh, ASS, A-S-S. And show implies that this is going to be an ongoing thing, and this is essential for reasons I'll get to in a moment. ASS implies it's not going to be very good, and that is also essential. That is also essential because if I do this with the idea of doing something good, then I'm not going to do it. And this so I used to have very severe obsessive compulsive disorder for many years. The OCD is dramatically better, but perfectionism still really limits my life and specifically really limits my career. And so when I say I'm doing this uh, and calling this ass to manage expectations, it's not anyone else's expectations because the sad reality is very, very few people have any expectations whatsoever for me because very, very few people are, are aware of me. And this, in turn, comes down to, I think, my perfectionism. I don't put out a lot of content, though I hate that term content. I mean, contents are what you find in a cadaver's stomach when you do an autopsy. It's not fucking art. But I don't put out a lot of content because uh, I... Uh, I struggle with the perfectionism. Where I do, actually, that's not true. I put out a lot of stuff, but it's always live. I do hundreds of shows a year. And people who aren't performers, the idea of performing live in front of an audience will seem scarier than just putting out a video. But for me, it's far less scary because with an audience, it's unfolding in real time. And I can gauge their reaction and adjust. It gives me at least some sense of control over the unfolding process. This, recording something, putting it out there, it is a much bigger relinquishment of control, a much bigger surrender, which is scarier, but again, essential for my career as well as my healing, generally. Because yes, the OCD is a lot better, but uh, perfectionism really limits me. And at the root, OCD is ultimately about perfectionism, getting perfect certainty, perfect clarity, being perfect, the stove is off, perfect, uh, your hands are clean. I don't have those forms of OCD. My OCD... I'm going to use the past tense. I'm going to say was. Yeah, uh, about decision making. The debate is past tense or present tense. Because I wouldn't say I'm entirely cured, but the really sort of um, heavy duty OCD is not, it, it's rare for me. It, I don't want to say it never happens, but it's rare. And in fact, it happened a few days ago. But in contrast to years ago, where OCD could take over for days or weeks at a time, this episode was an unpleasant afternoon. And that's as bad as it's been in months. And before that, it had been, I, I would say, you know, a half dozen times a year, I go down the OCD rabbit hole for a day. And if you were to ask me, generally, I'd say, yeah, I really don't have OCD. But the reality is this perfectionism is, in fact, a form of OCD, a more subtle one, a less destructive one. But the paradox is because it's less destructive, in some ways it's more destructive because it goes under the radar. When the OCD was really bad, I knew I had to get some degree of freedom, otherwise I would literally die. I was suicidal. This level of OCD, not only do I feel like I can live with it, but part of me likes it. Why? Because there's a payoff. There's always a payoff, I think, with what we commonly term mental illnesses. That's what perpetuates them. But when it was bad, there was a great deal of suffering, and the payoff uh, clearly was not worth the suffering. Now it's tricky. It's tricky because I do get a payoff for perfectionism. First of all, I get a high when I feel like I've done things perfectly, when I feel like I've orchestrated everything. Second of all, it allows me to feel safe, particularly in the domain that we're discussing right now, putting stuff out there. Not putting stuff out there unless it feels right to me feels a lot safer. And there's deeper layers to this too. Um, I took LSD on my birthday, June 2nd, and I saw on this trip that one reason I don't have a more successful career is because I don't want a more successful career, because I don't want more people seeing me, judging me. Yeah, in a way, it's kind of like I have exactly the career I want, which is just enough of a career to kind of squeak by, but certainly flying way under most people's radar. Most people do not know who I am. Most people are not aware of my work. And in a sense, that's the sweet spot. Enough of a career to, again, sustain myself, but not enough to have the real fear of being seen. 
it's interesting because I had an analogous trip, a mushroom trip about two years ago, where I saw the exact same thing in the domain of romantic relationships. I realized on this trip that the reason I hadn't had a really, truly, a profoundly deep romantic connection in almost 20 years was because as much as I wanted it, as lonely as I was, a big part of me didn't want it because I was afraid of getting hurt. And four days after that mushroom trip, I met the woman who is now my partner. It's been a few months since this LSD trip where I saw the same thing with the career, that the reason I don't have what I think I want, of course I think I want a bigger career, is because I'm afraid, and things have not entirely shifted. Not entirely, they haven't shifted at all, really. Well, there's been some internal shift, and I guess evidence of that is the fact I am doing this. Yeah. Let me be clear. I don't think this is going to bring me a huge audience, but what I hope this does do is breaks that vice grip of perfectionism so that I can start putting out more stuff and reaching more people. And it's not just about my career. It's not just about success. It's also, I think I have something to share that can help some people, especially in the domain of OCD, but generally too, because I do something that I believe is if not entirely, largely unique, which is really share my internal struggle in a way that I don't see in much art, much performance, even stuff that's often hailed as being vulnerable. You know, I, um, sure, I can single out some shows. Uh, Neil Brennan, Three Mics, Chris Gethard, Career Suicide, shows that were hailed for their great vulnerability. But to me, it was very much, and I like both of those shows, uh, and there was vulnerability compared to, you know, standard stand-up, but it wasn't you didn't actually feel that they were in, they didn't, to me, they didn't really show you their pain. They didn't really show you their struggle. They told you about it, which was a step in that direction. But what I do on stage is really bring it there in the moment with the audience. It's not like, oh yeah, I went through some shit and now I'm past it. It's like, this is the shit I'm in. And I think that's helpful. I think that's healing because we live in a world where on one hand, we pay a lot of lip service to vulnerability, but also with social media, people very carefully present these manicured versions of themselves and the danger, I wouldn't even say danger, the almost inevitable outcome of that is that most people feel lacking because when I see someone's social media posts, I don't think, oh, they're just sharing the best part of themselves. I mean, I know this rationally, but I think, oh, why don't I have that success? Why don't I, um, why aren't, you know, <laughs> why aren't I having this amazing experience they're sharing? So... Yeah. Um, I'm debating now. So this is just going to be a test. I don't even know how this looks on the camera, but I'm talking and part of me feels like, just keep talking, man. Just keep talking. But of course, the danger is that then I, uh, I look at the tape and it's all blurry. So I guess what I'll do is I will stop and then I can start this again. Okay. I just looked at the tape. It looks fine to continue. Um, I don't remember exactly where I was, but I know where I am and where I am in my life is I feel like a lot of possibility, but I've had a lot of possibility for a long time, by which I mean there's been opportunities, career opportunities, particularly related to a show of mine called The Mushroom Cure, but with other shows as well. And for some reason, these haven't really um, come to fruition but it's not some reason. Again, as I saw on this recent trip, a big part of me doesn't want more success. And that's fine. That's a choice. But once I became conscious that I was making that choice heretofore unconsciously, I have decided that I want to change that. I want to reach more people. And perfectionism is, I believe, the single biggest barrier to that. And this is an attempt to undercut that by putting out ass, by putting out things. So this is the, uh, the these are the parameters I'm setting for myself. I do this once a week. That simple. And I'm going to do it until my next birthday, June 2nd. So uh, what would that be? Uh, nine months? Yeah, basically for, for nine months, once a week. So whatever that math works out to, approximately um, 40 of these or so, and then I can continue or not. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, it's been humbling to see how much perfectionism limits me.
how much fear limits me, because that's what perfectionism is. It's fear of not doing things right, not doing things perfectly. And I think particularly, at least with this form of perfectionism, it's fear of judgment. Yeah, it's fear of judgment. So, um, all right, that's sort of the framework for this. Let me talk about what's going on in my life. Because I'd say that's another desire, is there is a desire. So I've been doing a show for a few years in different forms called Adam Strauss is Not Unhappy, which is an unscripted show, which is about what is happening in my life at the time I get on stage. And I found it incredibly rewarding and incredibly artistically. Uh, it's just helped me tremendously. Uh, but I'm not doing that show right now because subsequent to this realization of my own sort of, I don't even say self-sabotage, just not making choices that will further my career out of fear, what I've realized is, okay, I have to focus on the mushroom cure. So I'm putting Adam Strauss is Not Unhappy as a live performance theater thing on the back burner, but I do still have an urge to share what's happening in my life as it's happening. And so that, that, that's what this will be. And so what's happening in my life right now uh, I'm at my parents' place. Well, not just my parents' place. My parents live in a two-family house with my sister and brother-in-law and my two nephews and one niece. And it is a place of great love and great comfort for me and has been since they all moved in together. Now it's been 11 years, 10 years, 11 years, I believe. Because this is my family. When I say my family, I think most people my age, that refers to a spouse, potentially children. But I haven't had that, though I do have an incredible partnership now. But for these last 11 years, and in fact years before that, yeah, I rarely had any sort of significant romantic, not rarely, never really had a significant romantic relationship. A lot of relationships, but what would commonly be called friends with benefits relationships, though as I, <laughs> I have sort of a stand-up bit about this, not really a bit, it's true, uh, it's a misnomer, friends with benefits, because friendship is precisely what is missing in these relationships. I wasn't friends with these women. If you define friendship as a enjoyment of each other's company for its own sake, no, that wasn't there. We had very little in common, me and these women. It was all about the benefits. So the deep connection in my life has been my family. Now I have this other very deep connection, this partnership with a woman named Anna who I love very much, and I'm also kind of terrified of. I wouldn't say I'm terrified of her. I would say, <sighs> all right, so I mentioned this mushroom trip. It wasn't actually two years ago. It was about, uh, yeah, well, I know when it was because I know Anna and I are celebrating our 14-month anniversary, and I think it's telling that I track our anniversaries on a month-by-month -month basis rather than the more common, you know, year or maybe early on every six months. I've reflected previously, it's kind of like how people in AA will be like, oh yeah, I've been sober for 438 days. And I think it reflects a similar underlying mentality, which is a sense of pride that I've made it this long with her. And part of how I've made it this long, in some ways it's been very easy because the reason, so mushroom trip a year and a half ago, saw that the thing I thought I wanted more than anything, a deep romantic connection I did want, but I was afraid of the vulnerability and therefore I had been essentially not allowing myself to have it by um, finding reasons why no one was right. What I call WIBLI, it's an acronym, uh, an acronym I've invented, W-W-I-B-L-I, um, stands for what would it be like if, and it's basically comparing distracted by sound here. Soldier on. I realized that the reason I didn't have... So on this mushroom trip, what became apparent to me was... Michael Pollan has a great quote. He talks about how psychedelics, specifically the mystical experience with psychedelics, but I'll generalize it. Psychedelics offer a graduate education in the obvious. And the very obvious thing I saw on this mushroom trip was that the reason I didn't have what I thought I wanted, which was a deep romantic relationship, the reason I hadn't had that for 19 years at that point was because I didn't really want it. Or more accurately, I did want it. A part of me desperately wanted it, but a part of me was afraid of the vulnerability. And so what had happened is when I found women who I could potentially have a real substantial connection with, I would find reasons to why it wasn't right. 
oh, the conversation isn't that good. Oh, we don't have the same sense of humor. They're not quite beautiful enough. They're not quite smart enough. There's something lacking in them or in the connection. And so, Pierogi, my, my sister's family's dog. Um, and so, We'll see if that works. And I saw this on this trip. And four days later, I'd actually, I'd met Anna, my partner. I'd met her before, but it was the first time we really hung out four days later at a party. I had no idea she'd be there. And that's when we first really connected. And it's been a huge shift in my life. A huge shift. But it's also occasioned some OCD. Uh, and this was the OCD I alluded to a few days ago, where I'm at my parents' place, and I started obsessing about when I should go to San Francisco, which is where she lives, to see her. I have a place I can stay there. A friend has an empty apartment. But it's also been very sweet being here. Surprisingly sweet in some ways, because... <sighs> My father has Alzheimer's, and I would say it is the first tragedy that has really befallen this family and me. We've been very lucky, very, very lucky, I see now. It's not that advanced, but there's very clear differences, and it's hard for everyone. It's hard for him. It's heartbreaking for my mother. They've been together for... 56 years? True partners. One of the things I was always puzzled about when I had this long period of, you know, effectively being single, not having a substantial relationship, was, well, I've had a good model of relationships. My parents always seemed unusually in love compared to friends' parents and just most people I'd see. Even after 50 years of marriage, they'd go away to bed and breakfast, bicycle riding on their bicycle build for two. They really were each other's best friends. And now it's past tense. It's very much a were because they're no longer partners. My father, you know, they can't, you can't have conversations with him. He's still there. His personality is still there, but the ability to have any sort of in-depth conversation is gone probably forever. I say probably because I am exploring possible treatments and there are some, there's some things that show some promise, but at any rate, this is where he's at now. You can't have a real conversation with him. And that's painful for me. But yeah, shattering for my mom, someone who had conversations with him all the time. Now she's essentially a caretaker for him. I don't think he's suffering as much as she is, in part because I don't think he's fully aware of what's happening, though he clearly has some awareness. Yeah, I realized a few days ago, I've never worried about them. Like, I was sort of the source of worry for the family, less and less as I've gotten older. When I was a kid, I was the main source of worry for this house. Mental hospitals, psychiatrists, punching out windows, just extremely volatile. And as I've gotten older, things have gotten better, and particularly as I've gotten a lot of freedom from the OCD over the last, you know, 15 plus years, things have, yeah... I was going to say they don't, worry, they don't worry about me anymore. I don't think that's entirely true. But they worry about me less and less. But I've never had to worry about them. The family's always been so solid. So that's different. And I think that is that both makes me want to distance myself and get the fuck out of here and go to San Francisco as well as savor the time that I have here with my father because it probably will only get worse. 
But to be totally honest, and this relates to perfectionism, so to the extent I have OCD, I would look at it now as my OCD is about optimization. And part of what triggered this particular OCD about when I should go to San Francisco is the fact that the weather here in suburban Boston is perfect. Perfect. Unusually perfect. I looked at the forecast when I got here every day, sunny. Warm, but not too warm. Yeah. And I love late summer, early fall in New England. The sound of insects. It fills me with such joy, especially at night, sleeping in this adjacent bedroom to here with the window open. It's this embrace of nature. And nature has always been the great, my great consolation. In my many years when I was very alone and lonely and isolated, I think what saved me was nature because I never feel alone in nature because I'm not alone in nature. There's trees, there's animals. So yeah, the thought of I could stay here, it's perfect weather. I'll do some work on their front porch. They have this second story covered porch, which feels very cozy or just looking out on trees, even though it's close to Boston. I mean, there's a lot of other houses, but this time of year, everything in full bloom. Yeah, I get very, very caught up in optimizing. There's this part of me that feels like if I can get things perfect, I'll feel perfect. I mean, that's what drove the OCD. So that was part of the OCD about when to go to San Francisco. Is it's going to be beautiful here and I can spend time with my family. But part of what drove it is there is a fear around this relationship. I'm not going to recount the whole relationship, but suffice to say, she's a remarkable person. She is significantly younger than me. I would say more accomplished in a lot of ways and understandably has or had reservations about me. Um, yeah, because she saw the OCD was not frequent even a year and a half ago, but does flare up. And when it flares up, I can be in this real state of inconsolability. But beyond that, just I can get very, I can have intense emotional reactions to setbacks. I can be difficult to be around when there's something bothering me. I can have trouble letting things go. And that raised concerns for her, as well as the age difference, for the very pragmatic reason that if we do spend our lives together, actuarially, statistically, I will die first. And so in the early days, I had anxiety about the relationship because I wasn't sure, yeah, how on board she was. But that's changed. She's fully committed to this. Not without doubts. I mean, one of the things I value about this relationship is we share everything, including our doubts. But yeah, I'm not afraid that she is going to leave me unless if I can't keep my shit together. And I'm not so afraid about that in this moment. There's just a fear. And I think it's just a fear of the vulnerability because it has gotten so deep. And I think it's also, this occurred to me the other day, I think it's kind of like, so with psychedelics, um, I have quite a few times been in the situation where I've taken, say, you know, a sizable dose of mushrooms. And I'm tripping, unmistakably. But I could go deeper. And so there's this point, about 45 minutes, a little longer, say an hour, an hour and 15 minutes into the trip, where I know the dose I've taken is pretty much at its peak intensity. And the question I have to grapple with is, should I take more? And I think this is a little bit of what my fear is right now with this relationship. I sense it has, we are very vulnerable. It's gotten very deep. We're in love. We don't hold anything back, but part of me feels like, not even feels like, it feels like a certainty. Of course we can go much deeper. And a part of me doesn't want that because I know with more depth will come more vulnerability. With more vulnerability will come more fear. The reason I was alone for so many years is because fundamentally what I was looking for was love without vulnerability. That mushroom trip showed me I couldn't have that. And so I've consciously chosen love with vulnerability. But the thing is, maybe, yeah, it hasn't gotten any easier. It's a continual choice. So it sort of feels to me like I'm standing on the edge of a precipice with this relationship. Like, you know, we've already descended pretty to some pretty substantial depths, but it can go much deeper. But do I want to go deeper? And of course, a part of me doesn't. 
a part of me actually likes the distance. So we haven't seen each other much in the last month or so because she was in Greece. I was there too for a while, but then, you know, I left, she stayed longer. And then um, uh, I was, anyway, I don't have to go through all the, <laughs> our geographical meanderings. The bottom line is I've only been with her four or five days in the past month. And part of me likes this. Part of me likes the distance because it feels safer. Part of me very much likes having a girlfriend. I don't feel lonely knowing I have this connection. But also having her at a safe at this time, this point in time, a 3,000 mile difference, a distance, it feels almost like the optimal solution. But maybe because of my father, I am more aware of my own mortality. I'm more aware of how comparatively little time I have left. And that drives me to not want to play it safe. One of the things that inspired my mushroom trip realization a year and a half ago was Khalil Gibran's just absolutely fucking brilliant poem. I mean, one of my favorite human creations, The Prophet, where he talks about the man who wants only, and I'm paraphrasing, maybe not exactly this, but the man who wants only the sweet parts of love, that man will laugh, but not all of the, oh, wait, the man who wants only the sweet parts of love will live in a seasonless world where he will laugh, but not all of the laughter, and weep, but not all of the tears. And the choice I made a year and a half ago was, no, I want all of the laughter. I want all the tears. This is my life. Why not fucking go for it? But the thing I didn't bargain on, and the thing I don't want is all of the fear. There's a lot more fear in my life. There's definitely more laughter. Uh, I wouldn't say there are more tears. Or if there are more tears in the context of this relationship, they're tears of like really engaging with life rather than the tears I'd sometimes shed before of the loneliness of the fact that I knew I was keeping myself out of life. I want all the laughter and all the tears, but fear. I don't want all of the fear. Fear is the single biggest thing that has driven me and maybe is the single biggest thing I'd say that I'm not sure, but I suspect drives almost everyone trying to limit it manage it, avoid it. Anyway, I really fell into OCD for a day, but it was really, really obsessing, really. And this this locked up feeling. I'd forgotten what it feels like. It's a very specific physical signature to OCD. My jaw gets very tight. My scalp feels tight, like the muscles feel like they're almost spasming, you know, which makes sense. There is this tightness to OCD. It's like this trying to just this sort of walls closing in, my, my, my brain just twisting in on itself, spiraling in on itself. But I decided to stay longer. I'm here for a few more days and then I'm going to, to California to see her. And I'll do some shows and, you know, see some other people. But it, it really is to see her at this point. Um, yeah. So that's where I'm at right now. It's a beautiful day here. I'm gonna go play with the kids. It's also my mother's birthday. We're gonna be going out soon. Um, yeah, I, I wanna say a little bit more. So yeah, I wanna do these every week. I wanna do these every week for no one but myself because there's fear around this too. And I believe this can bring me some freedom. The very fact of trying, I think, will bring me freedom. So, um, I hope you like this. Of course, I care very much about what people think. I want people to like this. I'd love it if a lot of people like this. But even if no one likes this, um, even if I don't like this, and I'm sure I won't like it if I watch it, uh, I'm glad I'm doing it. So, episode one of Ass. Uh, I have a feeling I may change the name, too. But, uh, yeah, going to do these every week until my birthday.